Welcome everyone. My name is Jean Oi. I'm the director of Stanford's China program. And this is a continuation of our uh, series, Biden's America, She's China. What's now and what's next? Next week, before I introduce our speaker today, I just want to alert you that on March 10th, two weeks from today, we will have Jude Blanchett, the Freeman Chair in China Studies at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We'll be talking about what's communist about Communist Party of China, about the Communist Party of China, uh, where he'll trace the legacies of Mao Zedong, Marxism, Leninism, and the CCP's vision of socialism and their effects on Beijing's leadership today. Today, we're very privileged to have with us Dr. Thomas Wright, who will give a talk titled US-China Relations in the Biden Era. And we have invited um, people like Dr. Wright to provide us with their perspectives on US-China great power competition and the current bilateral state of play in economic, military, and technology realms. Dr. Wright is a specialist who's focused on US foreign policy, great power competition, and the European Union, Brexit, and economic interdependence. He has a doctorate from Georgetown. He was a pre and postdoctoral fellow at Harvard's Belfort Center for Science and International Affairs, and as well as at Princeton. He currently is the director of the Center on the United States in Europe and a senior fellow in the Project on International Order and Strategy at the Brookings. His um, book published in 2017 titled All Measures Short of War, the contest for the 21st century and the future of American power. And he also has um, a book coming out in August called Aftershocks, Pandemic Politics and the End of the uh, Old International Order. Uh, he's doing this with Colin Cole uh, at Stanford. And we very much look forward to that book as well. And he has uh, kindly agreed he might you know, integrate a bit of that uh, into today's talk. Um, Today, what he is going to be doing um, in the talk is to analyze the roots of strategic competition between China and the United States and the various strands of thinking within uh, <clears throat> President Biden's China team. I just want to note that we welcome questions from the audience and please just type your questions into the question and answer uh, box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I will be curating questions at the end and posing them to Dr. Wright. Uh, and with that, I turn it over to Dr. Wright. Dr. Wright. Thank you so much. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And it's a great pleasure to be here. And I really appreciate the, the opportunity. And it's a welcome reprieve from book editing, I will say. And um, what I would like to do today is really talk about uh, four or five uh, things relating to the broad uh, topic of competition with China, which I think really uh, has become sort of a dominant uh, concept or frame, whether you're for it or against it in terms of US national security policy. And obviously some of that stems from the Trump administration's um, decision to put great power competition um, at the heart of uh, their national security strategy and their national defense strategy. And we've seen uh, a real uh, increase in tension, obviously, between the US and China over the last few years, particularly, I think, last year in 2020, which is something I will come back to a little later on. But what I wanted to start with, and the, the first sort of thing I wanted to talk about is sort of the origins of this. What is the reason why the US and China find uh, themselves in a strategic competition? And I think there's a few different um, sort of explanations that are offered from the policy community um, and political leaders on the one hand and academics on the other. And um, the first is that it is a, a, a classic story of a rising power and a, and a power in relative decline um, clashing. This is the Graham Allison sort of view on the Thucydides uh, trap, um, uh, but also you see it, I think in the work of, of some uh, Republican thinkers like uh, Bridge Colby uh, who, who, uh, and others who I think see it primarily as a military competition resulting from a change in the distribution um, of power. Um, I'm a little skeptical of that. I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. A second view 
is that it's a story really of a, of a, of a, of a governance decision by China that China has become a revisionist power, that Xi Jinping in particular is a revisionist leader. This is inherently the thesis of the recent anonymous article published by the Atlantic Council, which claimed sort of to be, to be a successor to the, to the long telegram, but it's all about um, Beijing and all about to some extent Xi Jinping um, and his ambition. And a third view uh, is um, that it's a really a failed sort of attempt to, to integrate China into the international order, that the West did not make enough room um, for China in the 2000s to be sort of co-opted into multilateral institutions. And when they set up organizations like the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, um, we rejected it. And uh, as China tries to uh, carve out its own um, sphere of influence, not just regionally, but also its own sort of preferred options for global governance and for, uh, for international order, that brings it into conflict with the US and with other democracies. My, my view is that all of these, I think, have a kernel of truth to them, but I actually think it's something sort of deeper um, than that. I think there's sort of two pieces to it. And, and the first is, I think it is more ideological than we thought maybe four years ago. And certainly even than I thought when I, when I, when I published my first book, although I did talk a little bit about this um, in that book, um, which is I think um, the, the, the governance system uh, of the United States um, and of China are both, I think, inherently threatening to each other. And this has created sort of a societal security dilemma um, for the last 10 years that I think has led to some um, decoupling and also rivalry. So let me try to explain um, what I mean um, by that. Um, I think it's instructive to look back to 2012 when Bloomberg and uh, News and the New York Times uh, both uh, through investigative reporting uncovered uh, corruption in China, you know, whereby they looked at land records and the, uh, the, uh, the members of the Politburo uh, were on paper of quite modest means, but their families were quite wealthy. And this, of course, kicked off uh, much of the corruption uh, 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 stream of, of investigations and stories uh, that we saw in the years that followed. It was quite destabilizing, of course, um, in Beijing. I think it's interesting because that was not a decision that was taken by the Obama administration, right? That was the free press, newspapers and media organizations just doing their job in the United States. And they did it in such a way um, that it challenged, I think, the stability uh, of the regime in Beijing. Um, that I think is emblematic um, of the way in which uh, liberal democracy, um, just by the virtue of fact that it is uh, liberal democracy and it does have an open society and, and freedom of speech and freedom of the media um, as an inherent component of that. And that if left unfettered, it does, I think, challenge autocracies. And that actually was seen as uh, part, partly a, 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 a side benefit actually by many Western leaders in the 2000s that as countries like China and Russia were exposed to uh, globalization and to the global economy and to liberal democracies, that they would change simply because of uh, the information flows and because of societal pressures and because of the attractiveness of Western ideas of democracy um, and, and liberalism, and that that would sort of induce this positive change from within uh, those um, societies. And um, that may very well have been true um, for the people of those countries, but it wasn't, I think, for the regimes. And I think what unites uh, Xi Jinping and Putin and, and maybe other uh, uh, other officials uh, in those countries is that they uh, realized that and realized that this actually posed um, an inherent threat to them. And they began to respond to that um, in the late uh, 2000, but especially from 2011, 2012 um, on. And I think they, as they see it, our sort of system does pose a direct threat to them. And I don't think they are necessarily wrong about that in terms of a pure sort of diagnosis um, that uh, autocracy, I think, uh, is on the back foot if ideas of liberal democracy um, are in the ascendancy. And on the other side, um, as we saw since, um, that system of autocracy, um, that, that, that authoritarian type of government 
um, simply by being itself and by uh, increasing repression to try to consolidate control and by using new technologies um, to do that and by trying to um, censor actors, not just domestically, but internationally from criticizing the regime and for trying to control the terms of engagement with international companies and with media organizations and to control the, international, the flow of information, all things that come quite naturally to autocracies, that threatened our sort of system of liberal democracy um, pretty directly, whether it was in um, smaller democratic countries that find them, found themselves being coerced or in attempts to try to, if not coerce, certainly to pressure uh, individuals or organizations or companies and multinational uh, corporations and media organizations and what they could and could not say. And then to try to create a world safe for autocracy by changing international norms and by exerting influence in international institutions. All of those things uh, were rightly, I think, taken by us as a challenge uh, to the values that we hold dear and to our system of governance. And to me, it's this uh, sort of mutual uh, recognition um, that each is vulnerable to the other and that really is sort of at the root cause of the competition um, between um, the two countries. And it transcends, I think, as important as they are, uh, you know, the uh, islands in the South China Sea or, you know, disputes in the East China Sea or longer term uh, sort of questions about US military power in the Asia Pacific. All of that is quite important, but I think what is new about this and what is somewhat ideological about this is this clash of governance systems and, and the insecurity it generates in each other. And then the impossibility really of accommodation. You know, it's I think not really uh, feasible for us uh, to be able to offer assurances uh, to Beijing that we will control our system so it's not seen as a, as a threat to them because that would mean uh, limiting or, or compromising values and interests that are very important to us, uh, like the freedom of expression, like the, the, the freedom of information. And on their side, um, I think we're unlikely um, to see a, a, a ratcheting down of repression or an opening up um, or, or, you know, placing controls on the use of these technologies for surveillance purposes or pulling back from efforts to influence uh, international norms in an illiberal uh, way. And so I think that, that to that extent, I think we are um, in this sort of competition between these two types um, of, of, of governance. Um, and then I think there's also another aspect as well, which is on the regional security side. I'll sort of say a brief word on this. Um, and it was a big part of, of, of my, my book in 2017. Um, but I think we also, on the international order side, uh, somewhat underestimated the importance, the relative, relative importance of regional security competition. When you look back to the international order as it was created after World War II, we think of it as being international institutions and global norms, but actually um, all of that was based on uh, healthy regional orders. Right, it was the fact that there was a healthy regional order in Europe and in East Asia that made the global peace, uh, global cooperation to the extent that there was any during the Cold War uh, more plausible and more viable. And the same was true um, at the end of the Cold War. If that regional security order falls apart, I think the international security order uh, falls apart too. So I think the regional piece of it is incredibly uh, important. Um, so that's sort of the first point, just how I think about this. I think it's a mixture of regional security competition and um, sort of a clash of, of, of governance systems um, that I think we will be locked in to um, for some time. So the second uh, issue I just wanted to raise was on the Obama and Trump years and how that I think contributed um, to what we're seeing now. It's certainly true um, that in the second term of President Obama, I think uh, the US did gravitate toward a tougher line with China. And um, we did see, uh, you know, we, we did see uh, increased freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea. I think it did become apparent uh, in that time um, that we were seeing some regression uh, in Beijing in terms of 
uh, you know, Xi Jinping exerting a greater control and the implications of that internationally. And of course, that was also uh, wrapped up in a context of increased rivalry with Russia after, um, after the invasion of uh, uh, the annexation of Crimea and the conflict with, um, with Ukraine. Um, and I think by the end of the Obama administration, much as they tried to place that geopolitical piece in context, I think you did see a movement amongst Democrats, amongst liberal internationalists, advocating for a tougher approach to China. And had Hillary Clinton won, I think you would have seen um, that emerge uh, in her term. I think that would have been a, a more central piece of her foreign policy. And there's a paper trail of different documents uh, that were written prior to that election and um, that would very much suggest that was the direction in which they were headed. But of course that did not happen and instead um, Donald Trump was elected president. Uh, he uh, you know, is, a, was a, is a man who has very strong views about the world um, that date back over 30 years. Um, I think uh, that's fairly evident now that his presidency is over, although it wasn't as evident um, at the time, but he basically believes that the US is getting ripped off by the international order and by its alliance commitments. Uh, he feels that trading relations that the US had with any country prior to him being president was a raw deal for the United States and was leading to exploitation, whether that was with Europe or with Japan in particular, which he had a particular uh, grievance with um, since the 1980s. And of course, he had an inherent sort of sympathy for autocracy and for strong men. He liked dealing with strongman leaders around the world, whether it was in business or politics. So that's sort of what he came in with. Um, but the problem he had was that there was very few, if any, senior qualified Republicans who held the views that he had. Um, uh, the, the, there was one or two um, like Mike Flynn, um, but they didn't last very long. So what we saw um, was that the professional class that came in to work with President Trump, um, I think latched on to the idea which they strongly believed in that US national security strategy needed to be more geopolitically competitive. It needed to be more oriented around China. And then we saw sort of in parallel uh, different foreign policies evolve over the course of the Trump administration. And the first was the president's individual foreign policy, which reflected his personal preferences, whether it was immigration, you know, anti-immigration or trade um, or concern about allies ripping the US off or particular issues, whether it's North Korea or others that he had a strong um, interest in. Um, so that was one track. The second track uh, was the track pursued by H.R. McMaster, Nadia Shadlow, uh, Rex Tillerson, later on Mike Pompeo and others that was gravitating more toward the China piece. And they, of course, in the national security strategy and national defense strategy um, opened up sort of a new chapter uh, in those doctrinal sort of statements that shifted US foreign policy much more toward China, much more toward competition with China, and particularly in the case of the Department of Defense that has strong implications for budgetary uh, decisions and for procurement. Um, and that I think was the, was the rationale by which many Republicans were able to support the Trump administration, right? It wasn't that they were fully on board with the president's personal preferences, but as long as the administration was pursuing um, this larger sort of strategy in parallel uh, with the individual Trump strategy, um, they felt that they were making a positive difference from their point of view in terms of the direction of US foreign policy. Now, these things were slightly in conflict, of course. President Trump uh, saw the China issue mainly through the lens of economics and trade. And there was always a question about what would happen if he uh, was able to get a deal on economics and trade, would he, uh, would he focus then on the geopolitical aspect or would he take his foot off the accelerator and maybe try to have more of a cooperative approach um, with China? It's worth noting, I think, that I, I can find no record of Donald Trump ever speaking about the importance of geopolitical competition with China or the substance of the national security strategy. Even when he introduced the national security strategy, he didn't really talk about it that much. He talked about his own um, sort of focus on that. So that was a tension that ran throughout US foreign policy until we get to December, January, 2019, 2020. Um, and, and that's the moment of course of COVID and the, and the initial sort of phase one 
trade deal, which I think is a really sort of important pivot point in US foreign policy. And that's sort of the third issue um, I would like to speak about, which does overlap a little bit um, with, the, with, the, with the book I'm working on with, with Colin Call, um, which, is, which is on the, the impact of, of the pandemic um, on international order and US foreign policy. Donald Trump signs phase one trade deal, uh, uh, signs the phase one trade deal with China in or uh, I think on January 15th. Um, the first case of COVID is in China on December 1. It's not detected um, until th that that's known. It was on December 1. It's not detected until mid-December, of course. There's a delay and, and a somewhat, something of a cover-up in terms of China coming out to the international community and that the international community finds out on December 31. Um, Xi Jinping sort of takes uh, control of the task force to work on the pandemic around uh, January 7th. And then we have this lead in uh, to, the, to the trade deal, uh, which is a success uh, from Donald Trump's point of view. And I think it's part of his effort to have a series of deals that he will then be able to use in the election to show that he's a deal maker rather than a warmonger, right? And that sort of shapes Trump's view um, of Xi Jinping's response to the pandemic in late January and even in the first half of February when there were all these statements about him praising Xi Jinping, when it becomes apparent um, that the pandemic has spread to the US and that you see uh, you know, that there will be a major lockdown with huge implications, negative implications for the US economy, then I think you see um, the president really shift uh, toward the more hawkish elements in his administration. And then for the rest of the year, I think we see Trump very much siding with um, that second group I spoke about, uh, this sort of parallel track foreign policy that saw China as the more center piece of US foreign policy. And with the president behind that agenda and that, that agenda uh, in, 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 in full swing, we see a series of actions in 2020 that I think were inconceivable in 2017, 2018 or 2019, including on a targeted uh, decoupling, lots of restrictions on Chinese uh, technology firms, uh, a greater and um, deeper relations with Taiwan. Of course, later on the labeling of, uh, the, uh, uh, of the repression of Xinjiang as a genocide. So all of that I think happens partly because um, of the of the of the of the pandemic, so it is a big uh, sort of change point there. I think it's a change point in another sense as well, though, in another very important sense too, uh, which is something I want to come back to when we talk about President Biden's challenges, uh, which is the pandemic really does raise this vital uh, question about cooperation with China, you know, and uh, whether or not the U.S. can and will be able to cooperate with China on shared um, challenges. Um, China uh, had put in place a series of important reforms um, after the SARS, uh, uh, SARS episode of 2002, 2003. They created a China CDC and they put in place reforms to ensure there was greater transparency and speed of communication internally and externally in responding to the pandemic. And those reforms are quite important um, in H1N1 um, and also in other, uh, in other public health um, challenges in the 2010s, China began to play a greater role in public health diplomacy. It sent somebody on the mission, UN mission on, on Ebola in 2014. We also saw uh, during that period greater cooperation between China and countries like the United States and France and others on, on global public health exchanges and on capacity building. Um, so all of that was sort of to the good and it was seen as a pretty significant success story. But when we got to December, 2019 and January, 2020, um, much of that melted away, right? And those reforms were less significant um, than some of the sort of visceral impulses, which brought us right back to SARS in terms of the, uh, the secrecy um, of the response and the reluctance to cooperate with the World Health Organization and the international community. And the reason this is significant and that it's significant, I think, looking forward is I think it tells us a lot about the limits on cooperation between the US and China, right? Here we had a real world um, sort of example of pretty successful cooperation. And uh, we always talk about the need to cooperate and shared challenges. Uh, but then when the rubber hit the road, 
um, it turned out quite differently and much more negatively um, than we would have hoped for. And that story, I think, plays out not just in the United States, but in Europe, in Geneva with the World Health Organization, in, 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 in many other parts of Asia uh, throughout 2020. And it's accompanied, of course, with a more assertive uh, Chinese foreign policy uh, and a more assertive Chinese domestic policy in terms of the approach toward Hong Kong and Xinjiang as well. So 2020 for me is a crucial year because of all of those developments on multiple fronts where you've everything essentially coming together. You have this inherent sort of distrust uh, between the US and China. Uh, you have this failure of these efforts of cooperation that preceded uh, the Trump administration. Uh, you have this global health pandemic and this uh, uh, assertive uh, response, and you have a very assertive, of course, U.S. response uh, toward uh, toward China. So that brings us to the U.S. election, when of course Joe Biden runs for election on a pretty tough stance toward China, where he says that Trump's the problem with the Trump administration's foreign policy is that it wasn't tough enough, or a talk to tough game would have let China off the hook in a number of areas particularly on human rights um, and the rule of law and international norms, uh, which of course is something some people in the Trump administration spoke about, but was also the one area that President Trump was probably the least uh, sympathetic or comfortable because his sympathies uh, were, 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 were uh, relatively illiberal uh, in nature. Um, so Joe Biden wins the presidency, I think having stated that publicly, but when you look uh, sort of under the hood of his uh, of, of developments amongst Democrats in the intervening four years. I think it's an interesting picture. And that brings me on to the fourth and sort of final topic I wanted to address before we have a conversation, which is, uh, the, which is Biden's um, foreign policy. Because I think it, we often look at the democratic debates in foreign policy and see it as an issue of, of centrists versus progressives, right? That there's, or it's a domestic focus versus an international focus. But one of the fascinating things uh, to me about the uh, uh, democratic foreign policy thinking in the Trump uh, period um, is that there is this active debate between centrists, right? There are people who served in the Obama administration who are debating publicly between themselves. And it's basically divided into two camps. And the first camp I call to restorationists who essentially uh, believe in the worldview as President Obama had it at the end of his administration, right? So they believe in very similar things that Obama sort of talked about at that time. If you were to hear statements that they made, they would be sort of in keeping as coming from a US official in 2015 and 2016. So the importance of balancing competition with China, but cooperation on transnational challenges. Um, the, the, the desire to, to get into and then to, to make a success of the JCPOA while play, you know, playing a, a, a role in the Middle East, broadly supportive of globalization and trade deals, including TPP and TTIP. Um, so on a wide range of issues, I think uh, you, you see this sort of continuity. Um, the second group, which I call sort of reformists, um, but it's really uh, just to signify sort of a break um, from Obama, are people who, uh, some of whom served in the Obama administration, who uh, still think he was a very good president, still believe in a lot of what he stood for, but on very important issues, call for a major course correction on key sort of assumptions or orthodoxies from the Obama era, right? And, uh, one of those is on trade and foreign economic policy, where you have the now National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and others writing about uh, the need for a change there toward a foreign policy for the middle class, away from trade deals that focus on access to markets for co corporations, toward deals that are more focused on macroeconomic issues. Um, and the other big issue is on China, where you see a number of Obama officials say, that successive administrations got China policy wrong, including Obama, that that era of convergence has given way to strategic competition and you have to have a more competitively minded uh, democratic administration if Biden were to win. And that China debate, I think, uh, really 
uh, is the most significant debate amongst Democrats, maybe alongside the economic one um, during this period. And it's sort of a blended debate, right? Everyone agrees on the need for competition and cooperation. So they agree on all of that, but they place different weights on different elements of it. Some, uh, those who want a tougher line are more willing to have friction in the relationship. They're more willing to push China to take risks. And they see it as a more defining uh, uh, competition um, than it being just another sort of an important issue, but one of many, right? And they're willing to sort of see much of US policy toward that prism, uh, whereas the restorationists tend to be, uh, tend to believe that Obama got the balance sort of correct and that you needed a strong sort of bilateral track uh, with Beijing uh, from the beginning uh, in the new administration. So this debate is sort of pretty alive and well. And to me, what's sort of very significant about the last two months is it seems pretty clear to me that President Biden has chosen to come in on the side of a more competitive approach, right? That they have chosen individuals and also made statements and made some early moves that indicate in the, in the first phase at least, um, that they are looking to have sort of a democratic or liberal uh, version of strategic competition with China. So it's very, it's different in important respects from that offered by Donald Trump. And I'll talk about that in a moment, but it's also a significant shift from where President Obama was in 2016. Um, and some of the people who were very active in that debate, um, more on the competitive side, included Jake uh, Sullivan, Kirk Campbell, who's now the coordinator for the Indo-Pacific, and Eli Ratner, who's at the, who's at the Pentagon, who all wrote pretty prominent um, articles um, making um, that case. So uh, Biden, I think, over the last couple of months has made um, that decision. And now they have sort of a foreign policy um, outlook that I think is placing the Indo-Pacific and even the term Indo-Pacific, I think obviously has some weight here in terms of indicating a particular direction um, that they that they wanted to that they wanted to take. Um, so I think that is sort of the, the for them one of the top two issues along with the new approach uh, to foreign uh, economic policy. So what I wanted to do in my remaining time is to talk about some of the challenges and dilemmas I think that will arise um, as they look at this, right? And some of the broader questions, because for me, what's quite important now is that we're, we're sort of in the second administration since the US decided to think very seriously and deeply about strategic competition with China, right? And what happens now will sort of, um, I think, set the tone for some time in terms of whether or not there can be a broad bipartisan consensus and um, what future democratic administrations um, are likely to look back to in terms of guiding uh, principles um, for this um, competition and then how to resolve some of those dilemmas and problems um, that will arise. So I'd just like to talk briefly about some of those um, challenges that, that, that I think anyone who's looking at this issue will have to answer. The first is how broad should the competition be? You know, is this a global competition where the US should be active in the Middle East uh, to compete with China and maybe Russia as well? Uh, is, it, is, it, is it going to cut across all aspects um, of the economy or is it a more focused um, competition? And to me, it should be fairly focused, right? I think um, that this is not the Cold War. We do have two countries that are highly interdependent with each other, even as they are devolving into more semi-autonomous sort of blocks, each led by one of the major powers that do have all of these interactions with each other. So there is a much more complex relationship between these actors than was the case um, during the Cold War. And there are parts, I think, of the relationship that are the, of that competition that are very crucial and that are parts um, that are not. And to me, on the regional side, you know, East Asia uh, is uh, very important. The Middle East, I'm not so sure. Yeah, I, I, in fact, I believe it is not a, of equal importance in terms of that um, competition, uh, in, in terms of that great power competition. And that one of the mistakes we want to avoid, I think, from the Cold War is seeing everywhere as a center of gravity. You know, that the, that's what sort of the mindset that got the US 
involved in, in Vietnam during the Cold War was seeing that as, as key to the struggle with the Soviet Union. Where we are now, I think it's really about trying to identify where the different centers of gravity actually are and engaging there. But I think that is an active debate, maybe a bit more on the Republican side um, than on um, the Democratic uh, side. Uh, the second dilemma I think that arises is this question of cooperation. You know, is how do you cooperate with rivals? Um, the US and Soviet Union cooperated on nuclear, uh, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, on the eradication of smallpox, and on a variety of other things. Um, but for the most part, the relationship was defined by a lack of cooperation. The US and China have more shared interests. So the question is, how do you do that? How do you work together on climate? How do you work together um, on pandemics? And I think this is something that needs a lot more work and is a real contribution that the Biden administration can make. It's coming up with a conceptual framework uh, for how to think about that. Um, uh, I wrote some pieces or a piece about a month ago on, on climate change and the risks of having a China policy that had climate as the top agenda item that was linked to other items because it could give Beijing a reason to withhold cooperation in China in order to get concessions in other areas and that it was important to silo that out or seal, seal that off so cooperation continued even if the rest of the relationship was contentious. Others say it's impossible to do that because climate is linked to so many issues. And others again say that, you know, it is linked to other issues, um, but there is a way to try to insulate it from strategic competition and that in some ways climate may itself become a zone of competition as the US and China compete uh, for clean technology uh, uh, first mover advantage and to be sort of a leader uh, in, those, in those areas. So there's a very active debate on the climate side. As I alluded to earlier, there's a very active debate on the pandemic side. If, when we come out of the pandemic, do we go back to the old style of public health cooperation with China? Do we try to work purely within the World Health Organization with China to deal with future pandemics? Or do we develop sort of fallback options with more like-minded countries, whereby the US works within global institutions, but then also has other options if that cooperation breaks down? That's a discussion I think that's only beginning to get underway. But this broader issue of how rivals cooperate, which also I think applies to Russia and relations with Russia and arguably with some other um, countries too, that's a second big a dilemma or issue, I think, uh, that the Biden team will have to unpack. And then uh, the third sort of issue that I think they need to address, um, well, the third and fourth, I'll take them both together. The third issue is ideology, how ideological is the competition? And the fourth is how to bring allies on board. And those two things are inextricably linked. But the Biden team, I think, is inclined to make a, a big deal out of the democracy and human rights and, and, and the rule of law, uh, both because they care deeply about it and believe that it's an incredibly important US interest at home and abroad, and those different pieces are linked, um, but also because they see it, I think, as a differential uh, between the US and China internationally, that this is something the US is offering. European allies in particular worried about, worry about that because they see it as a maybe furthering sort of an ideological cold war that may make cooperation uh, less likely um, and, and, and more sort of difficult uh, to achieve. So how to sort of blend that strong support for democracy and the rule of law and working with other democracies uh, while also preventing um, the, the US-China competition from evolving in a way that leaves really no room um, for dialogue uh, or discussion. I think that is also a very tough uh, sort of balancing act. And I have some thoughts on how to do that, but I'm happy to bring those up in the in the question and answer uh, period. I'll just finish up on one um, sort of observation because I think I'm at the limit um, of my time here. And that's that if you look back at previous eras of strategic competition, particularly in the early Cold War period, it's the early phase that is the least stable, right? It's the first 10 years, first five years, 10 years, that are most crisis prone. And the reason for that is, is that during that early phase, we don't know what the real red lines are. We don't know the general pattern of behavior. We don't know how and when 
the other side will react or really what the dynamics are on our own side that may drive us to action uh, or to inaction. All of that only becomes apparent not through various statements and policy papers, those are important, but by repeated uh, sort of iterations uh, of, the, of the problem, right? Where you have countries react in real time to many crises or real crises or to real world problems and dilemmas. And it's by getting a sense of that sort of pace of events and that sort of tempo that then the major powers can sort of calibrate their behavior accordingly. We are very firmly, I think, still in that sort of first um, phase. So I think the next four years could uh, be pretty dicey um, in some ways. Um, but to me, the great sort of challenge is to come up with, and everyone has their own term, but mine is sort of a responsible, responsible competition. Uh, so we have a competitive uh, a strategy toward China that takes the competition seriously, works with allies, but also tries to provide um, sort of a new framework uh, for how rivals can work together and, and if they can't work together, how to come up with fail-safe options so like-minded uh, liberal democratic countries uh, can work together uh, to create an international order that is hospitable uh, to their values and interests. And, and with that, um, I'll leave it there and I very much look forward to the discussion. Um, thank you very much. That was a very clear and extremely useful um, analysis. You covered a a lot of material. Um, let me start out the um, questions with a broad one um, of my own. Um, and you use this uh, term, the clash of governance systems, which reminds me in a part, the um, you know, earlier Huntington story, the clash of civilizations. Um, and with this um, clash of governance systems. I want to tie that with the comment that you made, the, one of the challenges about um, you know, how much of this is ideological, because that has been, a, a, I think, a very important question. And if I understand you um, correctly, um, the, the, the challenge or the danger is turning in this into an ideological clash. Um, is, one, is that correct? And then two, uh, to bring in one of the first uh, questions from the audience, but I think it's related. And that is, you know, if you have this clash, um, what, and this is from Tom Finger, question from Tom Finger, you know, what things uh, that the US would want to do that it no longer can do in East Asia or elsewhere because of China's rise? Um, given what you identify as China's fears about the US, namely the appeal and the efficacy of our systems. Shouldn't Biden devote more efforts to improving US infrastructure, R&D, education, social justice, et cetera, than strengthening the US military and constraining China? Yeah, no, great, great questions and, and observations. Um, so just on the last point, I mean, I think it's possible to do both. You know, I really do. I don't, I don't see, I actually think they're somewhat complementary, and I think uh, the trade-off um, I don't really understand how it works to say, you know, that the U.S. foreign policy apparatus ought to spend more time working on sort of domestic issues, uh, because for Secretary Blinken or for others, um, you know, it's sort of hard to see how that works. I mean, they their job is to play this pretty large bureaucratic infrastructure. I think Congress obviously does things for its own reasons, but I think it is possible, you know, to do those two things in parallel, and that. Um, the domestic agenda, I think, does make the U.S. stronger internationally, but that doesn't negate the need for a strong um, sort of foreign policy um, as well. Um, but with that said, on the ideological piece, look, I think some measure of ideological competition is, and, you know, we don't need to call it ideological competition, but some uh, role for values uh, in in the competition and in US foreign policy, I think it's both inevitable and desirable, right? I wouldn't like to see a US foreign policy that treated it as a purely sort of Kissingerian, you know, relationship that said nothing about what happened in Hong Kong or what's happening in Xinjiang. Um, I think there are broad questions of values in terms of, uh, you know, whether we are concerned about Huawei playing an active role 
uh, in Europe, for instance, or even in the United States. I mean, that's ultimately a values question as well as an economic and technological question because it's about what that will be used for. So I think that that is, uh, I think it is important uh, to, to have that, but I think it's also important obviously to preserve some um, sort of diplomatic space. The final thing I would say just on this is that, uh, you know, maybe it's a competition of governance systems rather than a clash. I think that's probably, I probably misspoke maybe during the talk, but I'd probably use the word competition because I don't think it really has anything to do with civilization or with anything about that at all. And, and all of that, I think is, and one Trump administration official did use that term, I think it's extremely sort of unhelpful. The point mm -hmm. I'm trying to get across is that in the Russian and in the Chinese case, you know, part of the reason why they are behaving the way they are is because I think they are deeply insecure about their hold on power and right. they're undertaking actions that then make us less secure. And there is no easy way to solve that because what it would take for us to assuage those fears are things that we would rightly deem to be completely unacceptable that we wouldn't want to do, right? Like prevent, you know, media organizations from saying what they want to say or, you know, uh, closing down the internet or suppressing free speech. So that's my main sort of point is that I think there was a point in 2008, 09, 10 and 11 when the autocrats sort of realized, you know, if we don't push back, then, you know, our societies will become more politically liberalized and, and we don't want that to happen. Okay, good. Let me um, follow up um, a bit on this. And this is a question from Dan Snyder. And he says that you have a you have pointed to democracy and human rights as a crucial area of defining competition with China and other authoritarian states. But as we see with cases like Navalny in Russia uh, or Burma in Asia, this is hard to implement in practice and already has led to some gaps between the Biden administration and allies in Europe and Asia. How do you see Biden handling this going forward? Yeah, I think this is a big, it's a challenge anyway. Um, it's a challenge for me to, uh, you know, to answer the question. I think it's also a particular challenge for Biden. So let me sort of take both those in turn. I mean, I think that there, there will always be inconsistencies um, on, on some of these and, and the actions won't always be in keeping with the statements. But to me, what's important uh, first and foremost is sort of the protection of democracy and the rule of law where it is currently being eroded. Um, and that if we don't sort of engage in that in a pretty strong way, I think that erosion and that democratic sort of liberal democracy recession will continue. And I think we see in countries like Australia that are under considerable pressure uh, from China in multiple ways. I think we see it from the actions of countries like Saudi Arabia, you know, toward Canada and toward Germany over the last four years. Um, that there are lots of ways in which uh, autocracies have been emboldened and are sort of, if not quite interfering, and sometimes they do interfere in democracies, at the very least sort of undertaking, you know, actions that can compromise our liberty at home, right, and uh, some of the values we, we cherish um, at home. And what we need to do is to work collectively with others, and the United States, I think, has a particularly important role as the strongest uh, uh, democracy uh, to actually have solidarity between democracies so they inoculate themselves from, you know, the term I use is sort of the negative externalities of autocracy, right? So, um, so how do we sort of make ourselves more resilient so we're less susceptible to that? So that would be my sort of general answer. I think then there are also issues like Navalny's arrest in Russia, or like what happened in Hong Kong that are more traditional where you're talking about developments inside autocracies. Now Hong Kong of course is a special case because you know, it wasn't democratic but there was a rule of law that was eroded. And so that sort of counts both on the regression side and on you know, developments inside an authoritarian state. But there I think there are some options you know, and the special status of Hong Kong is one of those and there are others as well. That brings me on to the um, question about Biden. I think their challenge is going to be whether or not they 
um, follow up some of the very strong statements they made with actions and then what those actions are. And I think we're seeing an early example in respect to Saudi Arabia uh, with this imminent report um, due on the murderer of Jamal Khashoggi, uh, where I think we are seeing a very deliberate effort by the administration to engage the king rather than the crown prince and to sort of make a very important statement on that. Um, and I think that is uh, significant. Um, there are many other, the, the uh, Burma, you know, Hong Kong, Xinjiang and Navalny are all other sort of tough cases, but pretty soon I think they will, you know, the challenge will be how, is, how do they respond? And, you know, it could include sanctions. I don't think they're hugely effective, but one area where they may make a big move is an anti-corruption, um, where they could, I think, make, if they were very, and I think anti-corruption is it's a complicated issue more than it's sometimes presented as, but that is one area there's been a lot of activity amongst sort of Democrats in those Trump years that that's where they want to make a big play is to go after these illicit networks of finance. And that's actually something that unites the progressives with some of the more centrist elements. So I'd keep an eye on that as well as a centerpiece of something Biden may come out with in the next year or two in terms of that values competition. Mm -hmm. Let me ask um, a, a sort of a broader question that again, going back to the ideological um, uh, factor. I mean, it's not like, uh, I think we all know, it's not like the values in this ideology has really changed that much. I mean, China has remained a communist country, uh, but there have been long periods when there was a lot of cooperation. So essentially, you know, what has changed? Why has ideology, why, you know, why has ideology all of a sudden become so important in this discussion? It's, and so, so is that in fact uh, suggesting that something else has changed, but we're resorting to um, uh, the, the use of the term um, uh, ideology? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a great question, and I guess I'd answer it by talking about the specific example of the pandemic, right? So why, why when COVID hit, was China reluctant, you know, to acknowledge it, um, to, to allow in the WHO, you know, to share samples of the early versions of the virus still with the international community? And, you know, in February, March and onward, to sort of take active repressive steps against journalists and doctors who did speak about it publicly and did raise the alarm. And I think part, you know, one could say, look, you know, an authoritarian state is always going to behave in that way. And they sort of behaved that way in 2003. And so there's no real change. Um, and anything in the intervening period that hinted at major change was, was not really going to last. Um, you know, that might be true, but I do think that the deteriorating sort of relationship between China and the West and, and you know, this insecurity within the regime, um, I think throughout the 2010s through to, to COVID, I think that made it a lot less likely that Xi Jinping was going to respond by taking a big risk that if he, you know, allowed full access and the full sharing information and that sort of implicated him and his regime and so are his, the, you know, the government in some way, um, that that would have been an acceptable price to pay for tackling the pandemic. Like, I, I think just all of those instincts were, you know, we need to fully control this, control the narrative and be very, very careful about what we share, which I think continues to today. So I think part of it's a survival uh, mechanism. And then I think part of it is also you know, the desire to take advantage, right? So, you know, the, the China, I think, did try to take advantage of the of the pandemic in Europe, uh, you know, in, in the spring and the summer. Obviously, the Trump administration, you know, saw this as a reason to, you know, as, as an opportunity to be able to get broader support for actions, you know, to compete with China. So I think that great power competition element you know, we, we really did both act as a constraint and as an accelerant um, during 2020. Mm, okay, let me now turn a bit more to the um, military. There are a number of questions. And, and one is the potential for military conflict between the US and China is increasingly worrisome as China continues to build its military strength. 
or between the two does not seem to be in the best interest of anyone. Considering the different pillars of national power outside the military, diplomacy, information, economics, finance, legalism, etc., do you believe the CCP is vulnerable or weaker in any of these areas? And how can the US best exploit these weaknesses to improve the balance in, of power in uh, the US's favor? And let me just add another one. And that is that's related is how will Biden then deal with Taiwan with the Taiwan issue with China? How will it reach the balance among geopolitical superiority, ideological value, and cooperation with China? Does Biden administration come back to strategic ambiguity strategy, at least compared to Trump? Yeah, um, no, great questions. Let me, let me start with the Taiwan one. Um, and it, it gets to the first one too. You know, th th there's, I think, as many people on, the, on this um, uh, session will, will know as much or better than me on. There's two different theories in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of sort of great power tensions and crises and deterrence. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, you have to be as clear as possible um, about your commitments. So the other side doesn't miscalculate and do something that then will lead you into a conflict. And the other is that, you know, the risk is that you'll be too rigid. And if you're too rigid, you might get called on a commitment and get dragged into it. And, you know, it's the, the World War One parallel is, you know, whether or not the, the UK got, you know, Europe got a message in World War One because of all these pre-existing commitments and these alliances that, you know, many people, particularly Barbara Tuckman wrote about many, many decades ago, or the problem was that Britain was not clear enough that it actually would get involved. And that had Germany known that Britain would get involved, then it wouldn't have actually uh, you know, been as uh, as assertive in that August crisis, right? And and I, I just mentioned that because I think that does play out on Taiwan policy today. Like, is the root of the instability that the U.S. is committed to defend defending under certain circumstances, obviously in in the in the framework of, of the um, of the policy, and that the U.S. has commitments to Taiwan, and that if China acts then that results in the conflict and the, 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 what needs to happen is that the US comes up with some sort of clever ways to be more ambiguous there. Or is the problem that, the, you know, that China would miscalculate by thinking that the US would not get involved and that you need to be clearer about that commitment. And that's a debate that's very alive among sort of scholars and experts and academics. Um, I think in the policy world, um, the general view is that the risk is actually being too ambiguous, right? That that could actually lead to a miscalculation on Xi Jinping's part, and that the U.S. needs to, uh, you know, needs to develop closer relations with Taiwan. I think it's fairly clear that Biden has decided, you know, at least in this early phase, uh, to continue sort of the close relationship that the previous administration was developing in ta with Taiwan albeit maybe in a little bit of a different way. Um, the fact that there was an official representative at the inauguration, I, I think we still haven't seen sort of a reversal, I think of that last minute change by Pompeo on the protocol side. Um, you know, there's been statements um, supporting sort of Taiwan. I think you are gonna see more continuity there. I think where, where they will probably see um, maybe an area where they may be a bit different to the Trump administration is they'll probably embrace the multilateralism piece and actually make the case for a greater international space for Taiwan in international forums. And that, that they will believe is more credible coming from them because they are also committed to those forums, right? So the Trump administration wanted Taiwan in the WHO, but then left the WHO or said, you know, gave notice of leaving the WHO, but sort of pulled the plug from, from all of that. So I think they see a difference there. Um, on your first question, just very briefly, um, you know, I've long thought that the, the security relationship while, or the security competition, while a major challenge, I don't think we're on the brink of war. You know, I don't think that Kevin Rudd or Graham Allison's warnings, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't think they, they um, are quite right, actually. You know, I think that there is, 
no one on either side who's advocating for an early war or a major war, that there's not this sense of losing time, you know, where you see people saying we need to have this now rather than in five years or 10 years. Each side, I think, understands that a war could be catastrophic. I mean, for, for, for Beijing, losing a conflict with the US or with Japan, you know, even a limited conflict will be existential in terms of regime survival. And for the US, I think, uh, you know, I don't think anyone's under any illusion how, how, how dangerous and difficult a, a conflict will be. So obviously each side has their red lines and they have, you know, interests that they won't back down or compromise on. Um, but whether or not they're each sort of, um, you know, positioning for wanting a conflict, I don't really see that as a, as a major dynamic at this point. Um, so, the, so the challenge is, I think you, the question are rightly identified is the balance of power. And it's whether or not that can, uh, you know, prevent, be prevented from evolving in a, in a very negative way that it would change the calculation, you know, in, in Beijing on what they could get away with. And, and I, I think we're likely to see, um, you know, continued, um, I don't think we're likely to see defense cuts in the, in the Indo-Pacific Pacific space. If Biden cuts the defense budget, which I'm not sure he will actually, but if he does, I think you'll see it as a very targeted uh, cut um, in very specific areas that are not related to either the Asia Pacific or uh, military R&D. And I would point people toward the many excellent writings of the now Deputy Secretary of Defense, Kath Hicks, who actually wrote a lot about this last year in Foreign Affairs and other journals about exactly where cuts could come from if, one was to go in that direction and how that would not actually undermine um, the force posture. So I, I see a continued uh, strong commitment. And I think, you know, Congress will be a part of that too, given the balance of power in Congress. Okay, good. Um, let me then go back to Taiwan, but bringing in the economic side um, and sort of this, the link between economic security and, and um, your, uh, military security. Um, and that is uh, the relation to Taiwan and, and maintaining stronger ties with Taiwan. Uh, and this gets into questions about our reliance on um, Taiwan for semiconductors and you know, the, the tech and getting into supply chain. So one of the questions is, what changes do you expect in the Biden era with respect to coupling and or decoupling, more specifically US relations over the next few years? Yeah, um, no, it's it's literally like the billion or multi-billion dollar question, um, <laughs> literally and metaphorically. Um, I think there's just been a shift, a fairly significant shift over the last sort of four or five years, not just in the Trump administration, but also a little bit before on decoupling. Um, not that long ago, I think uh, there was the majority of, of experts would say, Decoupling is a really bad idea, it can't possibly work. The two systems are way too interconnected. Now, the debate, and, and there was others who said, well, maybe it's necessary, but they were a minority. Now the debate is largely between those who say, well, yes, some decoupling will happen, but it needs to be quite limited and targeted. And obviously there'll be some decoupling on the 5G side and other areas, but the broader economy is sort of important. Um, and then there are those who argue to go further. So the, the, the center of gravity in that debate has moved, you know, and it's moved toward the decoupling. There are, there are fewer people, I think, who argue for sort of no decoupling or for not being sort of concerned about, you know, the 5G piece or sort of the high-end technology piece. So I think that that, is, that ship has sailed, I think, to some extent. And while we still, you know, need to see where Biden's gonna come out in all of this, um, I do think that we'll see continuity there with parts of what the Trump administration did. Um, there are other parts of the decoupling, whether it's sort of on the student side or cultural side, and also on the broader economic side, maybe where there may be reversals, significant reversals, perhaps. Um, I think an active debate inside the administration is whether or not interdependence strategically advantages the United States or strategically advantages China. So that if, it, if interdependence can be weaponized, 
who is it actually bad for and who is it good for? There, there are definitely some senior officials who are not convinced that it's inherently bad for the United States, right? I think some of them think, you know, it might actually ultimately net out on the positive. So they may think that decoupling, uh, you know, in that case, you know, could be giving up a strategic advantage in certain in the financial space, for instance. So I think it'll be largely an empirical debate where they will be driven by the research and the data maybe, and they may end up with a differentiated approach. I think they probably will, where I think you'll see real decoupling in, in some areas, but maybe not so much in others. And the final point I just make is that China has a vote in this too, you know, and I think we are seeing decoupling from the Chinese side as well. And we have for some time, I think they are worried about the exposure to the US and to, to other sort of democratic countries. And, you know, I think we're, we're, we're seeing that sort of play out in, in China um, in, in the decisions that they're making on the, you know, on, on everything from the move to be independent on technology uh, to some of the big sort of financial moves more recently. And I think they also believe, by the way, that they may gain leverage by some inward investment as well. And so I think they'll continue to foster that. And we've of course seen very significant investment flows into China over the last um, year as well from the US and from Europe. Um, just to pursue this a bit further, um, one, do you sense there has been any kind of, uh, you might say, return? Because the, the word was that, you know, the US business community was, uh, you know, probably that, that they were uh, much more negative than they have been in the past about China. Um, do you see any change in that? And, and, and in part, because there at least seems to have been some companies, US companies that actually have argued very um, strongly against decoupling. And then a final part of that question is, and this is based on some uh, talks we um, had earlier, directed by Holly, that you know companies and sort of both sides of the Pacific, they are making uh, backup plans, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're giving up on you know U.S. or China. It's just that they're creating backups, and and so I guess I want your opinion about um, does that make a difference to realize that 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 in terms of strategy? Yeah, yeah. Well, let me let me take the. Um... The second part first, I mean, in the debate on decoupling, there is a school of thought that says we don't want decoupling, we want greater diversification of supply chains. Mm -hmm. I don't actually see the difference. Like I know what they mean the difference is, but uh, I think ultimately that's another form of decoupling, right? Like if you have, if you have greater levels of redundancy and greater diversification in, in supply chains and another uh, you know, international ties so that you're not sort of fully dependent on China, then you are in a way decoupling from China, right? It may not be done through uh, legal means. It may not be necessitated by the US government or compelled. You may still have operations in China, um, but diversification to me is, you know, is toward the same goal. Um, so I think just, I, I understand that they're of different degrees, but I think it's, it's sort of a response to the same phenomenon, right? Which is, you know, we ultimately don't want to be completely dependent. Um, on the- um, But then let me just, uh, yeah. you know, if, um, but doesn't it have different implications though about the potential and this sort of responsible competition? Might not that lead more likely to uh, having cooperation with um, strategic competition? If there's diversification as opposed to decoupling? Yes. Possibly. Yeah, possibly. I think it depends on the on the on the area. Um, I mean, I could see I, I, I could see that. And I think that that in some areas, I mean, I find it hard to understand on something like 5G how diversification would actually be feasible. Um, but I think maybe on some other areas, including on technology areas, it might be. Um, there's actually another question. Um, that has come in that I think is uh, the interesting one for us to, our time is almost up to end with. And that is in a sense to play devil's advocate. 
you refer to the deteriorating relationship between China and the West, but um, it does seem more between US and China with most other countries taking a much less belligerent, more cooperative attitude toward China. Might this indicate the current situation is more of the US not being willing to give, a, to give up its position as the sole world um, uh, hege uh, hegemony and accept China as an equal world power? Yeah, well, look, I mean, I think this brings up a very important point, which is one I, I, I do, I, I feel pretty strongly about, which is on Europe. Because um, I think there has been, to me, a very significant shift in Europe. The comprehensive agreement on investment notwithstanding, Europe's become a lot more skeptical of China over the last year. Mm. Right? And their view is basically that their efforts to cooperate and to integrate China haven't really worked. And that they're feeling pressure from China all the time. And they want a common approach in Europe to be able to have more weight and pushing back. And to me, what that experience suggests, and you know, China is becoming a political issue in Europe. You're having parties run in elections on platforms mm. of pushing back on China. And it's not just the right of the political spectrum, it's the Green Party in Germany, one of the strongest skeptics, the SPD in Germany, both, you know, center left and green, both in some ways more hawkish in China than the center right in the CDU and the CSU. So you have real sort of changes. And to me, what that says is actually, this is not about the US, right? Because if it was all to do with Trump, then what you would see is that US-China relations would be deteriorating, but China-Europe relations would be getting better, right? Because China and Europe would take advantage of the fact that the US was out of the game for that period and they'd be working more closely together. The opposite actually happened. Right, so at exactly the moment where you'd expect, if you believe this theory, that you know, the, if the US became quite nationalistic, then you'd expect to see China and Europe move more closely together. The opposite happened, and China and Europe actually moved further apart. So I think that's you know, a very important uh, sort of example to illustrate that this is a broader phenomenon, mm -hmm. largely driven through China. And just the other point, I did remember the point I wanted to make just on the interdependence, you know, we often talk about business interests as if they are sort of the driver of, you know, the political side, right? And so if business doesn't want this to happen, it doesn't happen. I think one thing we've learned from the last decade, not just on US China, but also from Brexit and a lot of other things is that ultimately when, when business and politics clash, politics wins, right? Like when national security and business clash, national security wins. Uh, which is to say that where, if there is a significant gap between where official Washington is on China and where you know, some of the business interests are on China, that ultimately nets out, I think, more on the side of the, of the political national security concerns. And so I think you know, it's an interesting thing to watch, but I, I, don't, think, um, I don't think some of those investments ultimately will, will actually you know, be a real sort of break on, uh, on, on the trend. Okay, we have two more minutes. So let me just squeeze in this one question because it's related to your comments on Europe. And that is, how do you think Biden should try to work with European countries that are more beholden or influenced by Chinese investments, trade, uh, example, Belt and Road? Can Biden persuade or even pressure allies into turning away from China? Oh, this is a really great question and, and one I'm thinking a lot about at the moment. Um, and I don't know if we have time to, uh, I'll do my best. Go ahead. We'll be. I mean, I think Biden does not yet have a Europe strategy to unpick the lock of getting Europe on board uh, for a common position on China, right? I think the Europeans are worried about the ideological nature of the uh, uh, US uh, discussions in China. The, that aspect of Biden's speech in Munich concerned them a little bit. They're worried about getting dragged in uh, to sort of a new Cold War. Um, they are at the same time worried about China. There are things that they wanna do. Um, I think ultimately to, to cut a very long story short, this has to be done by a much greater investment in diplomacy with Germany, 
and I think uh, Germany is sort of the key to this. Um, I think the chancellor and her likely successor are both inherently skeptical of US competition with China, um, but there are things that can be done at a practical level, um, including on semiconductors and 5G, and then an engagement in the broader German political system to start out small, but actually begin to put the building blocks in place for sort of a common um, position. And then also, of course, to work with the EU as a single entity, uh, because many of the things that need to be done on China in Europe rest with the EU and not with NATO. Um, so things like investment controls, EU versions of CFIUS and the like, mm -hmm. all of that is more in that space uh, of the EU uh, than in the traditional military side of it. Oh, our time is up and it's perfect. It's exactly 1.15. Clearly, we need to have you back after your book comes out in, uh, in August. So uh, we look forward to um, finishing for you to encourage you to finish it quickly so we can benefit <laughs> from it. And thank you very much for your um, sharing your insights with us and thank the audience for all of the great questions. So thank you very much.